Uh, I'm Keith Christensen of Visa Minis. We're here with Doug Seacat, the writer of most of the fluff in the War Machine and Iron Kingdom. A good portion of it, but not all of it. Not all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, Simon uh, Berman does a uh, design fiction writing, uh, as does Aaron Miguel. Uh, Will Schick uh, has been uh, recruited into doing a little bit of fiction writing. Seeing some of that come into the, uh, certainly the no quarters, and then in the books as well. Yeah, and in the league fiction, and things like that. There's a lot of opportunities for different Right, well, we've got a couple questions, three sets, let's, let's go through those. Sure. Uh, we've got all the names of the Gargantuans now. Uh, we saw some of them at the panel last night. The Mammoth is a much larger Titan. Can you tell us much well, about anything else about the Mammoth? Yeah, what is the Mammoth? Um, it, it looks kind of similar to a Titan, but it's really not a Titan. It's probably in a similar family. It's probably, you know, they probably shared certain ancestral roots, uh, you know, in the same way that um, uh, two other similar species would share a certain look. Uh, but the uh, the mammoth is uh, a creature that kind of dwells in that. There's some large plains north of the Horn Empire uh, where giant creatures like the hydras and, and uh, Animantrax, and there's there's a number of oversized uh, creatures that like to crawl around up there. And so the uh, the mammoth uh, is from that region. Uh, Scorn like to like with everything else, capture and enslave them, and uh, strap some guns on them and send them into war. <laughs> it looked like it had a giant rail gun. <laughs> yeah, it, it's got like uh, I think four cannons on its back. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, there's the Scorn um, uh, approach to. Uh, firearms and cannons, ordnance, isn't quite as sophisticated engineering-wise as it is in the West. Uh, they don't have quite as uh, sophisticated like a reloading mechanism. And so one way to provide a lot of firepower is to have multiple cannons with, yes. with uh, a little bit of a feeder that will drop a couple of cannonballs in there. And uh, this is about as sophisticated of uh, storm ordnance as we've seen. So, so this is an instance of they didn't have mammoths before because they they actually have been in the Scorn Empire, but one of the nice things with Scorn from a developing standpoint is we're only seeing the things that have been sent into the West for the war. So it's, it's really easy to occasionally have something that maybe hasn't made it over yet. And the idea of the Mammoth is that Vinter actually maybe was preventing them from making the crossing. Uh, he had claimed that the bridge, the Abyss Bridge, that crosses the Abyss with the uh, turns out he was going blind. And uh, Nikita did a little test, uh, walked a mammoth across, the bridge seemed to hold, and so now we've got some mammoths. Well, in, this, in this case, it was logistics. Yes, mostly logistics. Um, what do we know about the Archangel? We've seen the sculpt here, it looks phenomenal. It's like going to be one of the most dynamic and really impressive sculptures. So uh, how did the Archangel come to be from? Now, with the, that is the case of something that's new. Um, uh, I wouldn't get into all the particulars, but the, um, the emergence of the Archangel has to do with Callus' mission, actually. Um, Veil sent Callus to recover some dragon bones from her mouth. Um, she was intended to use them for different purposes. Uh, but once they had access to them, Everblight, who was a very smart, uh, creative individual, um, uh, realized that he could make use of this uh, raw dragon substance to augment uh, dragon spawn. And so um, basically it's his, his next step forward in, in creating uh, sort of miniature dragons. Is, is combining uh, the, the blood of Warlocks, the blood of his uh, with his dragon blood. That ties into one of the questions I have later, I'm just jump on that. Yeah. You know, dragons aren't as much physical beings as they are beings of their heart stuff. Yes. So what is a dragon? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> a lot of people in our setting would love to know the answer. Dragons appear to be uh, somewhat of a unique entity, and it's hard to even call them a life form. It's, uh, a lot of people aren't even sure if dragons are technically alive. Um, they appear to be some kind of intelligent, uh, being that has its essence rooted in this nearly indestructible crystal, basically, that is able to create a body around it. Um, these crystals apparently have nearly inexhaustible amounts of energy. Um, they're able to create a body around them. They appear to like large uh, reptilian looking <laughs> dragon bodies, basically. Um, but the dragon itself is sort of contained within that authentic, and it all goes back to Torah, of course. Uh, first dragon who appears to have been around uh, as long as anybody can remember, as long as there's been legends. And uh, at one point decided he wanted some friends and uh, split his offing and created a, a whole group of dragons that turned out to be one of them.
So that's, <laughs> that's kind of basically the thread. On a scale of, let's say, 1 to 10, Shredder to Turok, where does the Archangel land? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, are you uh, a dragon scale? I'd give it a 6. <laughs> um, how about the World Wrath? The, it seemed like Pendrake had indicated at one point there was only one of these. No, no, I think that's been a misinterpretation. If you look, if you look closely in the Monster Mario Part 2, there, it is never described as in a single entity. Uh, uh, in our organization notes, we had a special, there was a different category for something that usually appears alone versus something that's unique. Like if you compare like the Lord of the Feast entry versus the World Wrath, the Lord of the Feast is a unique yeah, the indication the was there are no packs. Yeah, you usually don't see more than one old wrath in the place. You know, that can have, that can change, and as the wars escalate, you know, certainly on the tabletops, uh, we will see the occasional incidents of at least two of them being together. But in the instance of the old wrath, that's an ancient concept. Yes, a long time. Yeah, and we we'll get into that background, uh, you know, more in your answers. But but the, the old wrath at least dates back a number of centuries. You know, I think it might be over a thousand years. Yeah. I don't have that on the tip of my. Uh, it's implementing them by the issue of power, energy to get them on. It's a combination of things. They're definitely difficult to, to create. They require more blood sacrifice than is normally uh, the case for their circle constructs. Um, but it's also a matter of the type of war that the circle is conducting. Um, the, the circle had a number of these wolf rats basically protecting key sites, but they had been kind of involved in a lot more subtle uh, conflicts in recent years. Uh, to the point at which they didn't have as much need for a, uh, a lot of the world rats. But certain things have been escalating the Legion of Everblight and some of the other wars factions. And, and so being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of these these new uh, enemies uh, has kind of brought them out of the world, so to speak. The need to hit the fade is more reduced than the need to punch the walls. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, did we just say the Mountain King? Where did the Mountain Kings come from? Why haven't we seen them before? Uh, Why didn't the Duke Shaper know about them? Uh, uh, Shaper may have, in fact, no. But uh, the, well, I don't want to get too much into the particulars with the Mountain King. One of the ideas there is that they're part of an ancient legend. The Duke Shaper would have known about it wasn't necessarily sure it was true. But it was a, an ancient legend uh, talking about um, these massive trolls that were basically imprisoned uh, to stop them from consuming the world. Um, so apparently that's us. <laughs> so there, uh, there's they, Doom Shaper. Once he confirmed that the legend is true, uh, let's let them out. Why not let them free? <laughs> you know, let's out. We're having some problems. Uh, let's, 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 let's talk about the Colossal Behemoth. Um, the Behemoth was described that when that project was created, it was a huge undertaking. Yes. All the cast and lords like jumped in to to fund this project, and then once they finished it, they were like, sweet. This thing, incredible, we did a great job, we love it, right. too expensive, can't build more of it. So how did Conquest that? Well, um, the idea of the Conquest is that, uh, I mean, it's almost a completely different kind of a situation. We have, with the new um, well, we ate uh, a sort of one-off prototype that was built in a certain way. It had the finest materials, the finest alloys, uh, the use of multiple cortexes, and the materials that are involved in Cortexes are particularly precious. Um, they have uh, less access to some of the rare source minerals that are necessary to make cortexes. And so the type of a super sophisticated is not something that they felt was um, something they wanted to do. It was too much resource in one place. Um, with the rise of the conquest, we have a basically an arms race with Sigma. Um, the intelligence the spies uh, among the Gidorans learned of these great production facilities that Signar had underway in Caspia, the Hemo put in place to create the Swamp Wall, knew, and they knew that they had to respond because they couldn't allow Signar to have this technological advantage. So at that point, an impetus was put forward with kind of a similar scale of um, effort, but a broader scale than when integrating that with the Hemo, but to create the infrastructure that they needed to create multiple conquests. And a lot of corners were cut, I would say. <laughs> they, would, they basically rushed into conquest production. The individual conquests are not as sophisticated machines. They're bigger, they're stronger, they're uh, massive uh, artillery platforms. But in many ways, the human is still a much more sophisticated machine. It's got the partner piercing, it's got the piercing fist, it's core for multiple subcortexes. Basically, the human is a more sophisticated machine. It's a similar situation as with the firehead. 
sure. um, both the, the snowball and the conquest are mighty machines that can be produced in bulk, do require tremendous resources and materials. They're still very expensive, but they're not in that kind of one off special prototype kind of thing. It seems like the arm race, uh, like six hour gets there, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Peter gets there, that makes a lot of sense too. And Craig's has a different way of building things. Um, my, my interest was in the Black Anchor University. Yeah. How did they get blueprints? How did they get the knowledge? To well, um, the arms race, as we look at it, was basically between four factories. Signar kind of kicked things off with me having the idea of putting uh, some infrastructure in place. Uh, the other factions involved with protector and mercenaries and cable, of course. Um, and it's sort of a different story with each of these. Um, it all kind of comes down to the fact that Signar didn't fully invest in their colossal construction right away. Um, there was a lot of hesitation among the military and, and the government where they were having to take war jack factories off and making you know, other war jacks in order to uh, make this war jack. And that gave time for other powers to be in um, The Black Acres approach is totally different. Um, you know, the Galleon uh, doesn't have nearly the same kind of cortex grade as the one with Signars and the Signars are using. Uh, but they did have access to some shared labor. A lot of the mechanics that work in Caspia, um, you know, if you pay them enough, Sideline. they might be able to go to Clocker's Cove and work on another project. And so, um, you know, Clocker's Cove, which is where uh, the Galleon was made, is only a couple hundred miles away from Caspia. And there's a lot of shared personnel between the industrial complexes in both these cities. And so you can imagine there being some hiring, some, some shifts of personnel, and uh, basically, uh, the Galleon is, is built in an entirely different way. It's, it's much more in a mercenary style. Uh, it's, it's using um, uh, techniques of fabrication that was originally designed for ships. So the idea is they, the Black Anchor had been involved in making humongous ships, you know, uh, like doing Brutus and Calamities. And so they had the hardware to make a large machine. It was just a matter of turning that over into this new you know, structure. Uh, but again, the Galvin is not nearly as sophisticated as this one. That was actually going to be my follow up. It seems like when I read the rules for the Galleon, I was like, this has the feel and the personality of Broadside Stamper. Was he involved in the project? You'll see that he has a quick little cameo in the process fiction. He was definitely, um, we'll just say he's, he's the first buyer. Uh, or intended to be the first buyer. <laughs> that letter that was written about the conquest from Black Anger to its like, prospective buyers. That was really, I, I felt like that was addressed directly. Process. Oh yeah, yeah. It was the first so time Simon was responsible for that. We definitely had in mind the idea of them sending that out to a few black sign clientele. You give that to the richest mercenaries, you know, like you send one of those to Magnus, you send one of them to the party. You know, yeah. See if you've got some extra money and you have like a large, large oversized business. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, there was just let's talk about the fluff in general. Yeah. There's a few questions. Has there been the, all this fluff has gotten really far spread out. It's like every nook or every source book is all over the place. The Iron Kingdom, aside from just the Iron Kingdom, is going to have fluff in there. So is that mostly going to be based on a setting? It's much more of a setting uh, situation in those books. We're not necessarily going to advance the storyline in the role-playing books. Um, the idea there is we're taking advantage of the setting as it was basically near the end of Legends. We kind of like that period where there's a little bit of a lull in the fighting where Hador has sort of taken a break with the Dragonstone River. Uh, there's a little bit of ceasefire between the nations. Uh, Caspian Sewell has sort of stopped their fighting. We know that it's going to resume pretty soon, but we wanted to kind of take a period of time where uh, there's just a little bit of time to breathe, uh, where there's a lot of other things going on elsewhere in the kingdoms. And so we're more setting the stage for people to kind of run their own adventures. Uh, we might advance the plot with some specific adventures or scenarios that will maybe come out in a elsewhere. Um, but the idea is that we're mostly providing background material as well as rules to, to make it. Has there been any talk of uh, collecting the fluff in one volume or multiple volumes? That could be it's, it's definitely been something that's been considered. I have no idea where we are with that or you know, if that will come to pass, but we definitely know that there's, there's fan interest in collecting fiction. Is there anything I missed that you want to talk about? I think we're good. Thank you.